Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for being here from wherever you are uh, this evening. We are uh, so happy that that you could all join us from all the different time zones all around the world that are represented here, including of our various speakers. Um, tonight, my name is Molly. I'm one of the owners of Point Reyes Books. And tonight we are so excited to have Melanie Challenger and Paul Greenberg here to discuss Melanie Challenger's newest book, How to Be an Animal. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving a couple of little housekeeping notes about Crowdcast here where we're viewing the event. Um, so feel free to keep the conversation going in the chat to add observations and connect with each other during uh, during this talk. We also have a button that you'll see down at the very bottom of the screen called Ask a Question. And this is a place where at any point during the conversation, you can put your question, which uh, might be answered during the Q&A portion at the very end. We'll be wrapping up by around six or so. So these two will discuss for a little while and then we'll take some audience questions too. Um, as with all things that happen over the internet, um, tech glitches do happen occasionally. We will troubleshoot them in the moment if they do. But um, if you have an unstable connection or you're having trouble see, uh, with the audio, we might recommend closing some tabs if you have a lot of things open in your browser. We found that that helps too. Um, so thank you so much for your patience with whatever may happen. Um, I also wanted to start by sharing a couple of upcoming events that this group might be interested in. On Thursday, April 15th, Jonathan Meberg of the band Shearwater uh, will be discussing his fantastic new book, A Most Remarkable Creature, about Kara Kara's Walking Falcons. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday, April 20th, Baranda L. Montgomery will be discussing her new book, Lessons from Plants, from Harvard U University Press. On Friday, May, May 7th, we'll have pioneering ecologist Suzanne Simard on her book, Finding the Mother Tree, continuing a tradition that we have of books about trees at Point Reyes Books. Um, other events coming up are with Dara McNulty, Susan Bernofsky, Jhumpa Lahiri, and more. So you can follow along on this Crowdcast page or subscribe to our newsletter on our website for periodic updates. And I'll put that link in the chat as well. And now without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's speakers. So this evening we are so fortunate to be joined by Paul Greenberg, the author of James Beard award-winning bestseller Four Fish, An American Catch, and The Omega Principle. He's also a regular contributor to The New York Times. He's been a correspondent for PBS's Frontline and lectured widely on ocean issues at institutions ranging from TED to Google to the U.S. Senate. His most recent book, Goodbye Phone, Hello World, was published by Chronicle Books in November 2020. And Paul will be facilitating a conversation with Melanie Challenger, who works as a researcher on the history of humanity and the, national wor the natural world and environmental philosophy, her <laughs> environmental philosophy. <laughs> um, her books include On Extinction and How to Be an Animal, and she is a current member of the Newfield Council on Bioethics. And we're so delighted to have Melanie here tonight to talk about How to Be an Animal, which we are reading and loving, and to hear more about that world and that work. So I'm gonna turn it over to these two, and I will see you at the end. Great. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Melanie, before we get going, I, you know, with the conversation, which I'm actually really anxious to delve into, I have many, many questions, as I'm sure the audience does. But do you, could you read a little bit from the book? Um, this is the book, by the way, How to Be an Animal, a great book oh, that I'm, I really, I really I'm enjoyed. I'm going to have the English version. Sorry. Oh, if you want. <laughs> well, this is English. This is English. We yeah, just well, you know what I mean. We don't the UK, spell color the UK version. Are. <laughs> Very good then. Excellent. I love this version. It's got it actually has a um cover. I suggested the artist for this, who's a guy called Jason Holly, who's I think he's in San Francisco. Oh, nice. And he just does this fabulous stuff. So he has created an amazing cover. This Isn't is it nice when the cover goes more with techy? The book? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. So I'm gonna read something that um hello to everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I'm in the middle of the night here in in uh the UK so who knows where where my brain may go but I'll, <laughs> I'll start I'll start on the page um so how to be animal covers a lot of ground and a lot of aspects of what it means for us to be animals how we've thought about being animals and what what flows from that um and so um but at the end I I look at what's 
you know, I look at I look at a lot of the complications with being animal and a lot of the struggles throughout a big bulk of the book. But at the end, I start to focus on um, all that's beautiful uh, about being animal, and in particular, why um, these dreams that we might escape our bodies, might escape our animal skins, our flesh, and somehow sort of I don't know, live live in AI clouds or what have you, it is is the wrong way to go. And and hopefully that's going to intersect with with um, Paul's recent thinking on technology. Um, okay. A computer is supposed to be a tool, not a person. It should assist, not replace us. If we use a computer or a phone to do the work of a parent or friend in the early stages of a child's development, we assume that intelligence lives only in the brain. We forget that when people learn from one another, they not only exchange information that will improve their knowledge, they also exploit every aspect of their bodies to extend learning into movement, social intelligence, long-term memory and self-understanding. What happens if we replace the flesh that came into being on its own terms with metals or materials that we mine from an asteroid owned by a private company? Computer programs can be hacked, deleted or rewritten. Compared to synthetic models of intelligence, our bodies are much more invincible. Our conscious experience can lessen or disappear under limitations, yet the canny body remains. Even when Alzheimer's releases its acid through the memories and quirks of the self, for a while the body keeps on its intelligence. The gut does its work. The blood and cells and enzymes keep busy. From this perspective, we seem to be the temporary watchers of a life force that somehow knows what to do in our absence. It's as though there's a more authoritative wit through the living systems of our bodies to which we're fleetingly pri privy. We're hell-bent on thinking about what machines can do at the cost of noticing how awesome is the human body that made them. All of us panic from time to time about illnesses. Many of us rely on our health services to stay alive and well, but we forget that our doctors are only ever supporting our incredible natural abilities. Our immune system is made of many disc discrete elements that we can be beguiled into forgetting it's there, yet what a thing it is. The cells and chemistry inside our bodies must distinguish which stuff is us from which isn't and what's harmless from what could kill. It took scientists decades to establish how animals undergo immune responses to novel encounters with man-made chemicals that wouldn't have been in the environment of adaptation. How did the aspects of the immune system come to know something unknown, let alone classify it as a danger? What immunologists discovered was that there are capacities to probe and identify almost on a molecular scale. And our bodies do this because all organisms on our planet are fundamentally similar. It's kinship that makes our immune system work. I believe in you, my soul, wrote Walt Whitman in his Song of Myself. The other, I must not abase itself to you and you must not be abased to the other. In Whitman's vision, it makes no sense for the thinking self to, dis to transcend its animal body. Without the body, the soul is a pointless abstraction. When we try to save the person by ceasing to be animal, we forget that a person and an animal are the same thing. We are all, uh, there's nothing to escape. We are already what we should be. And in most ways that matter, we are already what we want to be. When we look at the stars on a crisp, dark night, we not only see the alchemy of light turning into memory, but our body also remembers a time without light. As our eyes adjust to the dark, they switch from cone to rod cells, an adaptation that can take nearly an hour. Photons of light interact with protein molecules in the photoreceptors of our eyes. We share the same essential molecule in our photoreceptors as all other vertebrates on Earth. Our eyes gaze on through the haze of kindredship. Beautiful. I'm so, I'm so glad you read that passage because um, my methodology in going through this book, which is so quotable and so, um, gosh, I've got to save that kind of thing, put it in my pocket quick, had been, I've had underlines, I had circlings, and then I had stars, <laughs> and, I had, and I had double stars. And that one was a underlined circle double star. So I'm so glad you started with that. Um, you know, I think for anyone who observes the natural world and feels the natural world important to them, this widening gap between this sort of the mind human and the body human 
is is increasingly troubling every single day. And um, so, but I'm wondering, you know, so this this you in in the uh, back of the book, you say that the you've been sort of thinking about this concept for about ten years or so. So I'm just wondering, what were the very first wisps of this book? Like, did you have, did you have a dream? You know, you 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 talk, your dreams come up in this, your panics come up in this, your moments, <laughs> your intimacies with your children come up. But like, what was there, like, was there, a, was there something that planted the seed in your head, something, that, an indignation maybe? Wait, so that's if no one's asked me that. And it's funny because, um, when I stop and think about the timeline, I, I think, well, hang on a second, you know, 10 years ago, I became a mum. So is it... I didn't want to say that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, the, the ideas really kind of, um, I think, have always been there in me. I, you yeah. know, I, I, I would say I'm a kind of, I'm a, I'm an amateur, you know, I'm an amateur naturalist, you mm -hmm. know, for, 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 from the get go, as all children are. And, uh, but I really just never let go of that. And I've always asked the kind of baseline fundamental questions about what living things are, what um, I often trip over into the moral question of what living systems could be or what, what we ought to do and those sorts of questions as well. Um, so I think, you know, like many people, I grew up with the shadow of the Anthropocene, with um, the climate crisis. And I remember in my 20s being at university and just thinking, how did this happen? You know, because we'd inherited this world. You have to try and make sense of it. Yeah. And um, so a lot of my early work was all was environmental history and, and looking at um, the concept of extinction, which, Paul, you so kindly reviewed for the New York Times <laughs> yeah. book review a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but that was really a young person's attempt to try and trace the cultural and industrial history of, of the Anthropocene in many yeah. ways. Um, and then when I came, I, I became pregnant with my son when I was actually in the, in the Arctic in, in um, Nunavut um, with Inuit hunters at Copen when Copenhagen in 2009, when that was happening. So it was this kind of collision of physical wow. changes in me, <laughs> being in the Arctic winter with hunters out on the ice, talking oh to them God. about climate change with Copenhagen happening. And that was really probably the moment that How to Be Animals seeded itself. Mm. Um, Literally, was it? <laughs> in so many well, ways. <laughs> I, was already, I was already crazily pregnant when I found myself. Um, I had, I had a, a, a research fellowship to, to um, uh, award to go for the Darwin anniversary to go out and research mm -hmm. with Canadian um, hunters and um, people living from the land, um, Inuit hunters. Um, and I think at that point in time, the collision of our ideas about ourselves and our estrangement from nature and the paradigms um, that have facilitated that were really the starting place for how to be animal. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that one of the one of my starred underline circled passages was also about how um, you point out that it's when um, male dominated societies are confronted with the irrefutable proof of our biological origins in the form of woman, that women sometimes suffer their greatest repressions and, and indignities. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, I mean, what is it about like just the physicality of birth that kind of is sort of a slap in the face to all this sort of high thinking morality and God and et cetera, et cetera? I mean, this is a whole conversation on its own. And the trouble is that, of course, it's very complex. And so one always um, runs the danger of of, 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 of saying some, collapsing some information a bit, being a bit unsubtle about it. But there's quite a lot to say to it. I mean, the first thing is obviously the way that women and their bodies are thought about um, shifts across time and it shifts across cultures. So, it, 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 you know, we haven't sung in one voice on this through time, but um, I think there is, if, if we were to look at the Enlightenment, for instance, which is where we've inherited a lot of our um, sort of human exceptionalist ideas, or it's certainly the idea that, I mean, it was always there in Greek kind of thinking. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we've, 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 we've tended to think of ourselves as exceptional. 
I mean, in, we in are modern... exceptional. <laughs> I mean, we are we are exceptional, but in yeah. lots of different ways. It depends. I mean, it turns on what we take exceptional to mean. Yeah. So exceptional, if we take if we just strip it from value assumptions for a minute, and we just mm -hmm. we take it to mean there's lots of ways in which humans are exceptional. There's no other. There's no other humans. In fact, my son was only saying to me today, he was just, I, mean, I was driving home from school and he was just like, you know, those brilliant ways that little kids do. He just was like, mommy, why are there no other humans? Wouldn't it be weird if there were other humans <laughs> living <laughs> alongside us? And it is, you know, it is a stark feature of, of the human existence that it's a very lonely one. We don't have any, we have chimpanzees, but they're very distant. This is like, you know, uh, six, seven million years ago. Um, we did have other humans living alongside well, us, but I was we say, don't anymore. You, you, um, you, you do point out that, and I didn't realize this, that, that there's evidence of Homo erectus being around as recently as, what, 100,000 years ago? Like, it, within not that distant a past. So we did have a moment where we were sharing this planet. Yeah, I mean, again, I'll flip back just just briefly because this is really interesting, and it's a, I'll flip back to the maternal thing because I think yeah, it might, sorry, I don't, you know, I don't no, I no, so many, there's so there is so much. The nature of this is. book is it's it's like the whole world, and you can go in many many different directions. And it's I really, did it in less than seventy thousand words, which I I was really determined to well do. Done. I thought <laughs> there's a back. little bit, there's a little bit of collapsing that had to happen. Sure, sure. Um, but I think yeah, so I. One, one thing that's very interesting, so, so we were talking about rationality or the idea of the mind um, as this being this source of what's remarkable about us or that what se separates us out. Yeah. I mean, this is woven in with ideas about the soul. Um, and <clears throat> you find this actually in Eastern and Western thinking that people are like, well, we do seem to have a very remarkable, we're, taught it, we're talking to one another, apart from anything else, we seem to have very complex behaviours. Everyone has had to do battle with that strangeness. We've clearly bleed and you know look very animal like and yet we seem very different to the other animals and the obvious way that most cultures have dealt with that it, you know certainly most of our major sort of um modern cultures you know modern civilization cultures have dealt with that has been to weave together a kind of spiritual element with the idea of our unique cognition but i think in kind of western enlightenment thinking this really got crystallized into um into very sort of logical and you know there were the rationalists and the empiricists and everyone was sort of arguing about the nature of mind and what is it is it, is it our free will our reasons our rationality all of these sorts of things either way they, it was an exceptionalist narrative about our mind and what our mind does and and this gave us our exceptional nature now you know this was a time when women anyway were were uh, limited in what they were allowed to do or you know in the way that they were perceived but obviously this is all all kind of perceived as a sort of mind you know or a, not necessarily mind-based because there were sort of strange ideas about where all of this was located and how the body yeah. all linked together at the time in, in with medieval thinkers but the idea it what it certainly pulled away from was that the sensual feeling sort of fecund body, the maternal body, would have been any real source of, of our specialness or quality. It was all just these kind of cognitive skills and in particular certain skills that only certain humans would be allowed to have or certain sexes would be perceived as having. You know, it was a long time before, you know, and there are countries in the world where it's still not the case that women's minds are thought of as, as being uh, the equal of, of male minds. And... And the female body, forget it. Um, and then, you know, within within cultures, there's been a tendency to control female reproduction. Of course, there's lots of taboos and sort of behaviours that are all related around trying to control female sexuality, female reproduction, um, and these come in lots of different forms. And what's really interesting now is that there's some sort of research from the, maybe the last 20 years in psychology um, where... They've looked at the way in which people respond to strong signals of our animality. So breastfeeding, for instance, um, and pregnancy and pregnant women and so forth. And there has been evidence, particularly in cultures like sort of Western cultures, where, where there's a high premium on this kind of rational, very, you know, um, controlled individualistic kind of way of perceiving human life um, that under duress, under stress, under threat, you know, um, 
that there is a res you know there can be a, a spike in a resistance to femaleness and, yeah. and because it associates too much with our animal nature and the things that we see as having less value or as being um threatening or problematic for us at the you know at the same time i have to say i think what you say really rang true for me i always remember when my son who's now 14 when he was born um you know like many kind of older dads i was like oh, how is this going to affect my creative life and da, 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 and all this sort of, you know, the anxieties that you point to a lot in your book and you trace all these anxieties back to their sources. So I can say that in, in a way, this, this book is kind of a form of therapy. You're like, oh, how come my shrink never brought up that? But, but one instance where I found the animal nature in me just suddenly rear up was that after my son was born, um, we were lying in the hospital and, um, uh, my partner gave my son to me and lay him on my chest. And, you know, they talk about the value of immediate skin to skin contact. And it was almost as if it was like sucking all of the thinking part out of me and relating on a very raw level. And I'm so grateful to this day to Esther, to my partner for suggesting that we do that because it like, I think was the defining moment of my relationship with my son. So, I mean, to your point, I don't want to take away from, you know, maternal no. qualities, but, but, but I think that touch is really, really something. Of course, and it isn't, you know, the, the, the maternal child bond um, is, you know, we're, we're in a, we're in an interesting point at the moment in how we're thinking about sex and biology and things like that. And there's a great fear of biological determin determinism. I, I personally don't think we have anything to worry about. Biology isn't, isn't isn't as deterministic in the way that I think we fear it is. It's actually yeah. really, really flexible, incredibly variable. Yeah. Um, and it's usually our prejudices that that sort of just get very selective about how we perceive biology. Um, and I think, you know, sexual characteristics is a good example of that. You know, our hormone, our whole neuroendocrine system is built to be very flexible. So when you're in proximity to your child and your partner, you know, your hormones will be affected by that. And then once you've disappeared off from them, each, each, I think it's roughly kind of two weeks later or so, your hormone levels will start to shift again. You know, this is this is normal. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, so, I th and, you know, we, we as mammals, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do piggybacks on the kind of maternal child bond, a lot of the kind of hormones and everything. But but at the same time, yeah, it's absolutely as much, you know, a male thing or a, as a female thing to to respond to to our infants and to our partners and to smell their heads and have our bodies respond to that and our behaviours and our attention, you know, shift at that point in time. Um, We've just got so far away from it and it, we're in a very troubled stage of being able to understand how we value that and what value it has because we're living in a paradigm that has told us not to value that for a long time, well, it, it, within Western paradigm certainly. Well, you, you know, you mentioned this this critical moment that we're in and I don't know about if you find this, but I think sometimes one writes one book as a counter argument to the earlier book, you know what I mean? Cause like you've argued all in one direction and like, well, actually, do I believe myself anymore? Um, so <laughs> I, I do definitely see on extinction um, and how to be animal as, um, as, as kind of looking at each other to some degree. And I'm wondering like, you, you, you do get into it, but um, I wonder if I can put you on the spot here and ask like, do you think do you believe, have you convinced yourself that a more intimate relationship with our animal selves could heal the world? Do you think that, you know, the rate of extinction that's going on could in some way be corrected? Could we, I don't know, could, could, could we both heal our anxieties and also stop the incredible destructiveness that we're bringing on the natural world right now through the, through the mending of that bond? I think I think it's it's an imperative. I think it's I think it's an intellectual imperative, you know, because we we have no excuses anymore for um, maintaining this belief that we have dominion over everything. You know, it's fi it's fine to do it without any moral justification. If you want to go out there as an animal and 
use up all the resources and use up all of the animals. Right, and, the, rab the rabbits know, in, the, in, the, in the thought experiment. Yeah. Fine, do it. You know, don't, it's, don't justify it as a mm. moral animal. That's mm. where the problem is. We must leave our morals behind at that point. Yeah. Um, I think we are, as, as the an animal at the heart of the Anthropocene, as the animal that is the core, you know, the cause of, of um, the loss of life on our planet, which is, you know, for me, is a moral catastrophe. Yeah. It can only be resolved through a moral shift. And I think we're just at a tipping point where we cannot any longer ignore either our relationship to other animals or our relationship to being animals ourselves. Because there's another, you know, not there's not only this incredibly disruptive event going on, which is the result largely not entirely, but largely of the first and second industrial revolutions. It is the consequence of those big innovations in how we manufacture and harness energy and use energy. <clears throat> but it's also, but we're also at this weird tipping point where we've got a fourth industrial revolution, which is all about industrializing biology and, right. and harnessing technologies in, in ways and the mind. that... Yeah, and the mind that it involve synthesizing biology, that involve um, brain machine kind of interfaces with humans, um, that involve um, CRISPR gene editing, genome editing, you know, gaming evolution to our, you know, to our um, purposes. That is, we still, we really haven't got on top of what that means for us. Uh, we're, we're mopping up as quickly as we can the mess of the first two industrial revolutions and doing nothing to do the critical thinking about the fourth one that's underway. Um, and the fourth one really require, is where it requires us to very deeply think about, about what it means to be human and mm. what, what is valuable about being human. So I think, yeah, I think it is, it, do we need a paradigm shift? Yes, we, do, we also need a, a long phase of kind of critical rethinking um about what it means to be human and what relationship we have to other animals now, i have a lot of colleagues in that i didn't have kind of when i did on extinction um you know i've since worked for a long time now in in sort of environmental history philosophy so i have a lot of colleagues that are from other cultures and i have a, a number of colleagues from indigenous worldviews for instance um and there's a deep wound within many of those communities because they've been so suppressed and their cultures have been so ravaged and you know um there's a, a strong conviction that 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 you know there are other ways that we have thought about relating to the rest of life on earth that might be better you know that might um uh, be more respectful in which we sacralize other species that we we sort of manage our landscape better and while I have absolute respect and sympathy for that my own personal feeling is that the the, con the condition we've arrived at now is so unique and so enormous that we really just actually need to start again we need to really start again mm. and re rethink it all from scratch that we can't default to a different model because um you know many of the the kind of ways in which people evolve their cultural worldviews uh, you know belong to um you can't just be imported into right. into into kind of new york or import, you know right. it's, it's it's just totally it's not manhattan anymore it's a totally different landscape and we have to we need different you know, moral and ideological tools to fix the mess that we're in. But. Well, that was gonna that was gonna be my next question, which is that you know you do such a good job at sort of picking apart everything from anxiety. Well, I want to say from anxiety to acne. I don't think you actually did acne, but I'm just gonna say <laughs> it. Um, but you pick apart so many different things and trace them back to both their biological origins and also often their misdirected origins in say enlightenment thinking or whatever. Um, that you kind of leave us a little bit naked by the end where it's like, well, what, you know, is there a basis for any spiritual belief at all that doesn't flow from our biology? So I'm just wondering where it left you spiritually. Like, did you come into this with any kind of spiritual beliefs 
did you come out the other side with a change sense? Um, and and in light with that, I'm curious. I actually wondered if you're if you're vegetarian or vegan. I'm wondering if you observe certain kind of sensitivities. I think you live on a farm, so I don't know if you deal with animals. I'm just you know, I'm just wondering what your personal cosmology <laughs> me, is. Pegging so, me in. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't. I'm, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I'm yes. So I am. Um, I'm, I'm, I call myself vegetarian because I, I'm mostly vegan, but yeah. I, you know, the, the, I, I don't mind free range eggs um, okay. if, if they're from a local farm, for instance. Um, but, um, and I, and I try to be, it's very, very difficult, but I try to get, you know, vegan shoes and vegetarian shoes and things like that. And, it's, it's always it's always very difficult and but I do try to buy ethically and I try to live you know live um in a way that that is a you know comes from a multi-species community mindset yeah. um so that's that would be my answer to that spiritually I'm an agnostic um so I'm not a kind of diehard ruthless atheist but I I don't come from any belief my father is I don't come from any belief system. your father is a diehard atheist or are you said yeah, so he is he's a diehard and, atheist, you know that yeah. takes that takes a certain level of commitment that I'm just not ready yeah. to do you know yeah, what I mean like I what if <laughs> no I'm I'm a definite what if agnostic for sure yeah yeah but but I I um I don't have any spiritual worldviews, no, it, it, you know, or, or anything that could strictly be called spiritual. Uh, yeah. I'm very, very respectful of, of, and have many friends who are deeply religious um, yeah. from all of the religions, you know, uh, major religions out there. But I, but I don't myself, um, and I come at the world totally free as much as I can be. From I, I. If if the answers I receive, you know, when I when I go on an inquiry are uncomfortable for me, they're uncomfortable for me. I just that's that's the price I pay for for digging around. Um, so try not to have any preconceived ideas, and I try to just follow where the information and the observation and the thought kind of takes me. Um, but I did find myself quite changed through the book. How so? Um, firstly. Um, a, a big part of the book is about the way in which we um, I've always had a great stake in how we come to do really appalling things to one another. Um, and I did a lot of work on that when I was younger on conflict. Um, and I I'd always, had, always had an interest in dehumanization. So there's quite a lot on dehumanization in the book. And yeah. And really, I came to think of it more as sort of dementalization, or at least kind of the devaluing of the signals and expressions and needs of another. That can be a human other, or it can be another animal. Um, and and I think this is key in our kind of incredible behavioral flexibility as an animal ourselves, that we have this huge range of choice, which is where our morality comes from. Morality is a function of choice in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so we have this huge range of, of choice and it, it can be choices that build relationships with others that are good for them or bad for them. And we mess around with with those our relationships and how we see other people to to suit and see other animals to suit our purposes. And you know, so if we're exploiting, for instance, we tend to shut down the kind of signals that might be where where the person or the thing being exploited is going to be expressing uh, resistance to that, for instance. Um, just really delving into that and turning the lights back on and making sure I've always got the lights on that I'm always valuing another mind that I'm always listening to them even if they're saying things I don't like that I'm always paying attention to the signals of the minds and agency and intentions and feelings of other species has just it's like colored the world in everything you know and in I find it releases some of the anxiety that we sometimes experience that mm. that actually I feel it sounds really cheesy but I feel very yeah. full of love all the time I feel so in love with the birds and the insects and but also the people people of every different kind of 
shape and size and color it, it's you know if you turn the lights back on again it has an effect on your whole body i mean it clearly does it has an effect on your hormones and your mindset and you know um that has been transformative at a subtle and a stronger level for me i mean i think i was always quite an empathic person but i, I think it's just made you know i i'm very careful to be respectful of other people's minds and feelings it, it, now. it definitely comes through in the book and i also want to share one sort of funny coincidence which is um this photo of the harry harlow experiment right which i think i catch i caught a shade of your horror at those experiments where monkeys were deprived maternal connection and made to bond with a furred animal a furred doll versus a wire doll um and there's something very cruel about the experiment and it seems very it's it's very much a man from the 50s doing the experiment but i just wanted to drop what funny thing which is that my mother worked in harry harlow's lab no. yes oh my goodness and she says she well she says she's passed away but she told me that she sometimes sneaked into the cages and hugged the monkeys for readers who don't know the whole story but harry harlow basically was trying to kind of i mean if i if i'm summarizing this correctly he was trying to understand the bases for maternal filial love and early connectedness and he would have a wire monkey that just a wire doll that just had a like a, a milk nipple coming out of it and they had a furry one right which didn't necessarily have uh, a, a feeding apparatus but yeah but monkeys would gravitate towards the fur regardless but i remember seeing a documentary about that and well they would go and feed and then go straight back to the fur it was and, straight, and straight back to fur. And, fur and i remember seeing a documentary of that and you look at the faces of those monkeys the ones that have been deprived of of social interaction and it is like one of the cruelest images that i've ever seen and that you know some excuse my french bullshit academic situation where they're just trying to you know, prove a point, but at what price is that point proven? I thought, it, in a way, it's very emblematic of the kind of empathy I think I that, just that you say we the need. women as well, couldn't I? Because that's what's so crazy about it. I don't. Yeah. Really, I personally don't think I needed experimental proof that you know <laughs> bond, bonding is responsive to touch. This is a nice segue to talking about your book actually, because oh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, you like. I think you know we should because I. So I read Paul's book. Um, you can you can look at me through the cover. See, yeah, uh, <laughs> good nice question. Hello world. I have a nice link with this. So <laughs> when people who who haven't read it yet, when they read it, you, you will find the thing that I found most. Um, you know, but it's all to do with touch. You know, Harlow was proving really that touch is crucial to it, it, early years. Touch is crucial to the long term well being of. Yep mammals you know yes Duh. <laughs> Duh. Um, and touch you know it's a funny thing when touch is now all done at a distance when we can't touch when we're allowed to touch at the moment anyway you know which god knows what that's going to do to, to lots of young minds and bodies but you know when we're all on these devices all the time so i i read your book and i i had a funny memory back from when i first had my baby which I thought you would appreciate because I know your daughter's going to marry in Inverness soon and this all happened in Inverness because oh, wow. I was living in the highlands of Scotland at the time and I had my baby in Inverness um, Gabriel. Oh, wow. and yeah and so I had an iPhone because um, I you know I was living in New York when I came out <laughs> and I got an iPhone and I still had it and so and this is and I was you know I would be feeding my baby and you know you're there for like an hour or whatever feeding your baby and I'm, I'm reading like I don't know Mary Shelley's back in sign or something on my iPhone right. <laughs> and you know it's scrolling through it and I suddenly was just so you know why am I not just here even though I was very deeply attached to my child why am I not just you know um satisfied enough by just being in this moment why have i got this weird instrument that some techno Absolutely. technology company has made me and i threw it i threw it when i next went into Inverness into nice. the recycling bin nice well i just to quote this study from for, i quote this one thing from the in in goodbye phone in a two, 2017 study of children aged 7 to 24 months it was found that infants and toddlers had higher levels of distress 
and were less likely to investigate their surroundings when their parents were on their mobile devices. So, I mean, it's right there in front of us. It's like, and you know, the other thing that came up, <clears throat> I mean, you know, that's a whole other topic that we, sh you know, we need to get to questions from, uh, from the crowd, but, um, you know, this whole COVIDization of the world. So um, my friend, Carl Sofino, the great writer who I see is on the chat. He's, he said to me when the book came out, when the book came out, he said, Paul. I, yeah, and I believe he's expressing mutual admiration. Um, but Carl, yeah, great author of um, uh, Beyond Words and uh, most recently Becoming Wild. But uh, but Carl said to me, Carl also has a wicked sense of humor. And he said to me, um, uh, have you thought, because COVID broke just as my book was coming, well, it was COVID was raging as my book was coming out. And he said, have you thought about calling it uh, Goodbye, Goodbye World, Hello Phone? <laughs> Because <laughs> that's pretty much what <laughs> that's pretty much what happened. Pretty much what happened. Um, but you know, to that, I, I, you know, whatever. We'll see. You know, books always have their spaces. But I just wanted to show one image, which I mean. So I, I, I have this. It's it's a little short, little chapters. And one of the pieces of advice is feel the com complexity of imperfection. And it, I quote a friend of mine who's a writer, and he said, uh, writer Rowan Jacobson, he said, I have this not unserious theory that smartphones are going to extinct the human race because, because all the adolescents I know who have grown up with them are uncomfortable with touching other human beings, you know, which is like devastating. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Oh boy, I don't know. Anyway, um, let's not go down too deeply and sadly into those places. And let, and and also let's let's celebrate the great job that um, the UK is doing with vaccination. Uh, you know, relatively. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get too in front of myself, but we're hearing good news coming out of the UK. No, it's and it's, it's going well. Um, you know, and we're we're. Ho I mean, I think probably looking at the death figures, the outbreak's probably been huge. In, yeah. in in the UK, um, yeah. so I suspect that's also a factor on top of the right. you know of the numbers driving down. On if top you of the if you thing. if you know your biology, you know it's the weak that get called out first. Unfortunately, not always, but often. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just it. Ha I, I suspect we've just we have had a huge outbreak. It, yeah. um, uh, I, the numbers are much higher than you know than than we we than officially at the moment. I suspect the same is also true in America. Yeah, it looks for like sure. The, you know, I, 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 enormous. I actually had COVID right at the beginning in March, and oh, you know gosh. where you know where I got it, the hospital. Yeah, uh, I was visiting my father in the hospital and picked it up there. But I want to go down that COVID. That I, I find actually one of the most boring conversations a person can have is is the COVID conversation because it goes around and around and around. Everyone knows it, but. Um, but all I want to just say is that I think the combination of your book and hopefully my book, the, the, the message really is that we went down an inhuman rabbit hole in the course of the last year. Yeah. And as we come back to ourselves, we really can't leave touch behind. And if there's yeah. anything that needs to be left behind, I think it's the screen world. And, and thankfully, I think people, you know, are kind of nauseated by the screens. I mean, here we are in a screen yeah. right here, but, you know. If you want to go it's hang up. It's been a great experiment, hasn't it? In, it sure has. in almost testing the thesis of your book. Ha yep. Has it made our lives richer and happier when we've, you know, for a long time, a lot of educators were trying to push for more and more and more integration right. of screen time for teaching. That's you know, right. And I think this has been a really good reminder that people, children learn through gesture. They learn through touch. They don't Absolutely. just learn through being on screens. And in fact, that they get exhausted and fatigued and miss all of the, you know, um, gestural and, you know, and social aspects of how you learn and become a fully formed mind in the Absolutely. world. Um, you know you know, it's interesting. Uh, I teach a course called "The People Versus the Sea" at New York University, and it's um, you know it's a seminar class. In the past, you know, it's really great being in the same room, blah blah. blah. But for half of last semester and all this semester, we've been online. But one of the things I started doing was offering in-person office hours at distance. So there's a French cafe that follows the rules, and we can sit six feet apart and have espresso and meet each other. It's so interesting because originally I met all the students just like this, and yeah. then and I formed impressions of them one by one, every student that came to see me, and about half of them have come to see me so far in person, completely, totally, radically changed my impression of them, completely. Mm. Like, uh, like, just, I mean, not in ways that are very animalistic, actually, like in ways yeah, that yeah. like, you know, like, oh, like, I mean, it's not like, 
I don't know. It's just very, it's very odd. Anyway, listen, we're coming to the, we have 10, only 10 minutes left. I, I, this is really. I'm one o'clock in the morning for a one, Oh here. dear, sorry, my guys. Oh gosh. <laughs> listen, I'm coming I to Inverness. I have made sense. <laughs> I'm coming to Inverness in August. So we're going to have to pick up this conversation in greater detail in person. And we'll, maybe we'll share a transcript. But before I let you go, we do have 10 minutes and I would love to open it up for questions. Um, so if you see something, um, Pop it in the ask question box, and if you do, you know, if you don't, I'll, uh, believe me, I have many other things I can ask Melanie. I could also scroll through the chat, but I'd rather have a direct question. So, go ahead, people. I'll just keep carrying on while I'm waiting for a question to appear. Um, I did see actually, and I saw you had a little um, digital tete a tete with um, a new here, Ansu here rather, and um, uh, Ansu oh, said about our, bacteria. Yeah. yeah, she said she wrote our notion of personal identity identity has been turned on its head by the modern understanding yeah. of our symbiotic existence with bacteria and the ones in our lower intestine in particular so much for the frontal lobe so much for the frontal lobe exceptionalism um, care to comment any more on that one yeah so I mean I, I do nod to the um, to this one so I, I mean obviously we talk about homo sapiens as though it's some sort of edifice and obviously right. species species really are processes they're kind of a, a moment in you know they're a moment in biological time um so as you know but they're always in a process of exiting what they were before uh, we are processual and on top of that you know when we go down to this you know the level of the individual we're not straight you know we're so obsessed again with the brain-based kind of event of mind and subjectivity that we forget that yeah we have other DNA in, in, you know, our mitochondria. Yeah. We have, you know, we have um, all kinds of parasites on our bodies. We have bacteria, you know. We're we a are, living, we we're are a living a, collaboration. We're a colony. We're a colony of <laughs> we're cells. A colony. We're a, <laughs> some of them don't have the same DNA as us. I mean, it is an extraordinary, um, yeah. And and the the role of bacteria that we've perceived as, as pathogens, you know, for, for quite a long time. And, and we're having to have a paradigm shift about how we see um, microorganisms and what yeah. we think a good creature is. What it, What is a good life form, you know, um, because obviously bacteria perform all sorts of incredibly life enhancing services. For that matter, viruses, which are strictly not animals, you know, but sort of I guess almost like bit, just sort of bits of life, if you yeah. like, Li bits of livingness. Well, you know, but but not not strictly. Um, Carl um, Zimmer has a book on this at the moment, which I haven't read yet, but I've noted. Is We're not going to nail you to the wall on, on the livingness of viruses, but yes, carry on. Yeah, but anyway, you know, the fact that multicellularity is like viruses probably had a key role in the emergence of multicellularity. You know, we we can't just see them as these horrible things right. either. They, they, it's just very very complex out there, and and um, and in terms of cognitive exceptionalism, yeah, I mean, this is we're at a, we're at a kind of just just starting. We're just sort of climbing up the mountain. We're not even there yet at seeing just how complex because we we've, we've uh, one we haven't funded cognition animal cognition properly or well because it has no obvious application as Irene Pepperberg said you know yeah. um, but also that we have really constrained what we're allowed to say about um, you know we, we're so worried about over you know anthropomorphizing or over explaining right. from the data um, that we've really it, but you know, there's no question that we ha are in a world of other minds, and they're minds that happen in the arms of the body. You know, the minds that happen in don't have to just happen in the kind of prefrontal cortex. There are lots of other ways that biology has resolved what it is to be a, a thinking agent in the world, and we're just at this incredible precipice where we're going to see all of that. I think. Yeah, I, I direct I direct everyone, in addition to Melanie's book, uh, to Carl's uh, Beyond Words, which really yeah, tussles awesome with that book. in a really big way. Um, and and it, I just, but to go back to your book, you you say this thing that I think is really right for the moment. Um, on page sixty one of your book, um, as the technological gulf between us and animals widens we feel more reassured than ever that we are unique, yet simultaneously scientific knowledge proceeds to close the gap between us and other species. So I think that really, that's really 
where we're at. Um, I wanted to get to another question. Um, uh, uh, some uh, Tanya was asking if what our next books are going to be. So Melanie, do you have one on the on the? So you you began life literary life as a poet, no? <laughs> no, I my CV makes no sense to many people. I love people um, whose CVs, and I hope you've never joined LinkedIn. <laughs> I love LinkedIn. I actually love LinkedIn. Oh, no. LinkedIn's okay. the only thing I do. Oh, I don't shoot. do anything else. Sorry. All right, Sorry well. No, this is a really great conservation community, particularly okay, in places right, like right, India. Right. So I enough do it. Like, I'm sorry. Enough, enough LinkedIn. I'm not What's on Twitter. <laughs> um, so my next book is all about this. So I'm writing a book which I'm sort of faffing about with the title, but it's all about. Um, Agency actually minds intelligence. So it's a natural history of intelligence, but it's really looking at this huge sea of intelligence and intelligent interactions. And um, I've I've coined this term psychosphere with a philosopher of mine, friend of mine, Helen Stewart. Um, you know, so it's going to hopefully do for mind what biosphere does um oh, for, cool. for biology so that's that's my next book what Excellent. about you i don't know <laughs> i'm having i'm finding it hard you've to got see a lot of time now come on i know how much time you've got now <laughs> you've not got your phone now that I've, now I've got this flip phone um i do have a lot of time you know i live at ground zero um i live um literally stone's throw from uh ground zero and for the longest time, I've had a garden. I have a vegetable garden on the terrace, and I actually produce one bottle of wine per year, which I call Chateau Nul, as the French, you know, because the French, when they want to say somebody's a total loser, they say, il est nul. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and my wine est nul. Um, but it's also de nul. It's from Ground Zero. So um, I've thought a long time about doing a book called The Ground Zero Gardener, which is sort of a reflection on New York as a you know, back and forth through time from Manhattan to the future and back and what a sustainable city would look like from a Oh my God, I would read that. From a personal a So yeah, I mean, it's mostly what I do. Like, you know, I spend a lot of time in the garden. And actually, it's funny, I was finishing your book in uh, in my garden this morning because it suddenly got warm finally here. So, um, oh gosh, there's so many questions. Um, let me, do you mind going a little bit? Who we just, I want to get to Carl's. Carl's. Carl asks, don't you think understanding non-human cognition has a drawback that the more we understand, the less comfortable we can be with our treatment of animals and our sense of superiority? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why it has, to, that's, that's fundamentally why the blindingly obvious, which Carl, in fact, so eloquently um, sketches out for us, you know, so that we can't ignore it. Along with, you know, um, other sort of great thinkers on this, like Franz de Waal, you know, who are showing us that, you know, we can't, we, it's, it's not in doubt that, that other animals have um, complex minds, experiences, um, intentions, and so forth. I, I actually, I, I can't find a way, I've been trying to do it kind of op-ed on this, but I, I just can't, you know, I can't quite find my way into it. But it just, it is staggering that we are living with this incredible whole sort of world delusion now about the way we're treating other animals. And the fact that animals clearly express their, and rebel against the way that we yeah. behave towards them that their lives do matter that their lives matter to them that they're complex that they you know um and and i i kind of if we were to really what would happen as carl is saying if we were to properly be attentive to those minds and needs as moral agents to moral we, subjects we might explode it, it would be <laughs> revolutionary i mean it would yeah. be revolutionary but um and so, of course, people, I mean, I work on ethics committees and I'm always the lone kind of, mm, <laughs> you know, don't think that's quite true, that comfortable narrative you're telling yourself about yeah. human exceptionalism. You know, I'm always flagging it up with my colleagues, but I hear back all the time things like, yeah, but animals don't have a concept of death, so we don't need to worry about their deaths. No. You know, it's funny, no. the other day, the other day um, in my class, I invited... I don't know if you know Jonathan Balcombe. He wrote a book called... Um, I do know Jonathan, yeah. Yeah. So he wrote a book called What a Fish Knows. Yes. And um, I had a very talented student uh, do the presentation of that book. 
and she actually drew a, 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 an experiment from the book and tested it on us. So like, this is what fish can do. Can you do the same thing? And by and large, the fish performed better on the cognitive test than the people on the video yeah. chat. So that was pretty good. Um, all right, Pick listen. Any animal. I mean, I'm just <laughs> <like> that. <laughs> We're at the nine o'clock. I mark definitely can't I... echolocate. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> we're we're going to spare you, Melanie, because it's now nine o'clock here in New York, and it's what six o'clock there in California, and must be like time for your five year old to wake up over there. So, Molly, I'm going <laughs> to hand it back over to you. <laughs> yes, thank you so much to both of you, Melanie and Paul, for that wonderful conversation. It was such an honor to host this this talk about so many um, topics that are so important in the spaces that we create here at Point Race Books and the events that we focus on. Um, how to be animal, you can all buy the book at the link at the bottom of the screen and there have been <laughs> other great recommendations in the chat. Um, I am so sorry that I did this weird thing where I put the word N in the title while I was well, reading it earlier. It. Don't worry at all. Don't I think I might have done it I'm too. sure, but that doesn't make it better. <laughs> um, but anyway, it is how to be animal. And um, we appreciate this conversation and all of you being here so much. Um, the I can the wonderful it. thing. I feel, I feel really bad that I haven't looked at the chat and it looks like there's been some really good. No, there's tons of questions. It's just oh, the nature really of the beast. I'm so sorry, everybody. I know, I know. And, and um, you know. Email uh, me, I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> Or, you can go find Melanie on LinkedIn. <laughs> or if you if you actually if you go to paulgreenberg.org, um, there is a place to ask questions, and I can ferret or fer uh, ferry. I don't know. Get questions or over ferret. to Melanie <laughs> or ferret. How to be animal? I'll, I'm, that's my. I'm the ferret. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best ending note I could follow imagined. that one. Um, <laughs> follow the ferret. <laughs> And on that note, um, this event was recorded and will be immediately available um, once we close out here. So you'll be able to get the link on this page where you are viewing the event and you can share it far and wide and watch it again um, and engage in that way too. So thank you all so much for being here, for being wherever you are. Um, we wish that we could be doing this in person so that we can have all the good interaction and touch. <laughs> and uh, hopefully next time and before too long, that will be possible. Okay, and Melanie, okay. Let's do, we'll do a joint reading in Inverness in 2022, okay? Done. Okay, Done. fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank all right. you very much. All right. Thanks all. Bye. Have a nice Bye, evening. Bye-bye.